everybody. Welcome back to the show. It is the 50th episode of Screen Preach. The big 5-0 is here. And I've been saying it forever. You know what it is. You know what it's of. I don't even know if I should tell you what time it is. Because it's very late. It's not even Friday night. I love doing the Friday night thing because Friday's a work day anyway. Might as well get it out. You might as well do all the the heavy lifting in one day so that the weekend can be a weekend. But it's not even Friday anymore. Uh, so I'm recording this very early on Saturday morning <laughs> because I had I had oh my god I had quite a um, day today. And I just, I, I had stuff that I just knew that I had to do. I just had to do a bunch of stuff. There was, there was things. Car needed to be washed. I had this bookcase come that I had to put together. And I did a pretty solid job at that if, I, if I'm tooting my own horn. Um, yeah, donuts, like, why are we not just in bed sleeping? It's like 1 a.m., yeah, but I'm going to do it. I'm doing the, it is here. I hope I'm not too loud for people either because it is late and like, I don't, but um, my neighbor always said she can never hear me uh, recording, but I don't know, who knows. Um, yeah, it is the Marvel Cinematic Universe special edition episode of Screen Preach, and I'm very excited to deep dive into this because I could go all day talking about it. I mean, I talk all day long about Marvel. And uh, and the crazy thing, the, the, I guess the first thing you should know about me with Marvel is I don't, I've, I've probably said it on the show before, but I'm not, I, it's not like I, I'm a big comic reader. Like, I didn't read all the Marvel comics and, I, and like the movies started coming out and I was like entranced, entranced, enthralled. One of those is right, um, or they're both right. Um, and, uh, and then, then I was like, oh shit, the, the, the adaptations are fantastic and I love the movies. No, it, it's actually kind of the reverse. Um, I actually have not read a lot of Marvel comics aside from, I've, I've, I've been reading Star Wars comics by Marvel, um, and mostly by Dark Horse, but by Marvel too. Um, yeah, when it comes to comics, I've done a, like the whole Batman arc and I've done Star Wars. And it's on my list. It's next. You know, when I finish all that, I have a lot of Star Wars that I'm reading, and I, it's fun. Um, but I, I, I'm not done. There's just, it's, there's a lot, so I'm not done. That will be next. I'll do Marvel Comics, and I, I have a list of arcs I want to read. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, like I said, it's the reverse for me. The movies made me love the comics, like make me want to explore the comics more. And so that's kind of why I get really into, like, uh, the films even more because when I see when I started to get into the films a lot, it, it caused me to read, uh, read up on on what happened in the comics without actually reading the comics. So I have like all this knowledge of things that happen in the comics without actually reading them. Um, and it's kind of like shit. Well, when I do read them, it's not gonna fucking. I'm gonna know some stuff that happens, but whatever. Like there's still a lot that I don't. And I'll talk about it, like, even t today, like, is a good example. I just finished watching watching the fifth episode of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and I will talk about it. It'll be how we start, as we always do, and it's perfect, because it's Marvel, and it's a Marvel episode. No reason to not do the recap. Um, yeah, this week week's episode had a cameo, and and uh, I, don't, I didn't know who this character was at all. So, similarly to how I always do, I just read up on the character, and, and it makes me more excited to know what's coming. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and now I'm hoping I don't forget to talk about it. It's not like I have everything right here for me to like... So when I forget things, it pisses me off. Because I do try to do that. Like I try to keep the structure, you know? Um, but anyway. I know, like, we're, we're here, you know? What I mean, we're here... It's 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 the end of season one of Scream Preach. Season two starts next week. New new look, new feel, new, new just kind of just some changes. Um, 
it'll feel more new to me probably, but it's, yeah, I'm just switching it up a little bit, like the look of things and whatnot. But you might even be like, well, why did he put Spider-Man in the middle? Why that poster? First of all, we'll get to it. My my ranking of, of the MCU and, and where I put every movie on this list of from best to worst and everything. Spider-Man's not even above these two. It might be above Ragnarok. I don't know. I have to... I wrote it down. We're going to... Um, Civil War, it's definitely not Civil War, but, um, it is one of my favorites. The reason it's in the middle is because this is, a, like, a special, more of a special edition poster of the, that first Spider-Man movie. Because it's, and it's a direct, um, you know, fuck. How am I losing words here? Maybe because it's one in the morning. I'm losing some words. It is a direct copy of the Amazing Spider-Man comic number one, like the first Spider-Man comic, you know, where he's flying through the air with a with a thug under his arms. That's that's that was they they did that for the movie, um, and it was great. When I saw that poster, I snagged it because it's cool and it's not one you see as much um, for the movie. And uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So when we get to my rankings, that'll be fun. I'm also gonna. Just a kind of similar format to when I did the Star Wars special. We're gonna, I'll, I'll talk about how I think you should watch the movies. Um, but most importantly, I'm going to just voice my opinions on why this is such an impactful... Just, I mean, it's, it's not like I even have to say it. It's, it's obvious how, how big and how, how um, effective the... Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been uh, on cinema. It's and and I will make the argument. It, it, I'm going to be going off of a prompt of of my opinions on the MCU from from a few years back, and then also bringing in some new ideas. Uh, but the the MCU is like the latest movement in cinema, in my opinion. Now, the movement is a hard word. It's 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 a touchy word to use. Because uh, movement usually means a shift in, in uh, s- I suppose, sociological or political or progressive perspectives and the way cinema evolved. You know, like um, post-war cinema was a movement and uh, the French New Wave was a movement and Italian neorealism was a movement. Uh, so it's not a movement in that regard, but I'm calling it a movement f- because of its impact, because of its originality, because of its format, um, but mostly because it seems to, to have tackled every area you can think of in cinema and has, has dominated it, whether it's quality, you know, or storytelling, or... or uh, commerce, you know, big, big money, big blockbuster type, uh, type of, uh, films. So it's, 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 it's what I'm going to get into here. But as always, we will start with The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, episode five recap, fresh in my mind, just watched it. And right off the bat, obviously, uh, spoilers, spoiler. Spoiler-filled episode oh, every week. Um, this this episode was, you know, some people were like, it's 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 whatever. It was like a not not even it was a regular episode, not even that good, or it was just good, or it's just a filler or whatever. But no, it was a story episode. It was a character episode, very important character episode. I think it they needed to spend this. This episode, they they almost needed to spend the amount of time they did on, on on just really having Sam make a decision, and even Bucky make making a decision. You know, his whole scene with Zemo was kind of like that, and then it's kind of expanded on in, in his conversations with Sam throughout the episode on what he should do next and how he should approach actually 
trying to make the change he wants to to happen. But I think what this episode really did was I mean, it made me feel a lot of things, but it it made me think about how I hadn't noticed and, and almost how they bring it up in the episode too. They they bring up how how it, it, it seems to just be like an ignorance that, that white people seem to have too. I, I love that line where where uh, Bucky says, you know, Steve and me, when we talked about our plans for the shield, we didn't think about what it would mean for for a black black man to wield it. And, and he says, how could we? Because it, it, it does. It slips by. It, it can slip by even me. I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Like it just, you know, what it means to... To how can how can Sam be you know represent America if America has has never um, properly represented him or properly uh, served him and his people? Uh, so you know, and they play with that a lot in the scene with Isaiah Bradley. That there's a, another scene with Isaiah Bradley, which is super important. But it made me realize that, you know, as I've been talking throughout these weeks here about what it means for Sam to decline taking up the mantle of Captain America, I haven't mentioned the obvious uh, fact of things that is brought up in this episode that, that it, why should he? You know, like, why should a black man take up that mantle and... and represent the country and 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 serve the country when the the country hasn't done the same back for him or his people so that is something i had to kind of realize and remember that that is an obvious reason for sam to not take it you know that was probably going through his head the whole time and it slipped by a lot of people that that it was an obvious reason to not so blatantly take up that that to to, uh to wield the shield and, and to be captain america and uh, ultimately, uh, he he has to make a decision in this episode. It's it's a it's a very important story and character episode. Right off the bat, we get the we only get the one action scene, and, and yes, you kind of wanted to see like, I think at the end you wanted to see like like that moment where he really becomes. But they're saving it. Obviously, they're saving it for. The finale that next week, the, the last one is the one where it, it just all comes together in this next, you know, this culmination and this setup for the future now of these two characters that we love and and the new characters even that we've met. Um, and we'll see what their fates are and whatnot. But but we start with some action and, and the, the whole fight with John Walker is literally a taking back of the mantle and of the shield. So that was something that definitely had affected when I was watching. Like this, this is very powerful shit because this is like literally like the, the shield is it was taken from the people who actually are supposed to wield it. Um, and I think it, I, I, I again go back to the idea of of Sam and Bucky kind of embodying Captain America as a team, and I think the scene of them tossing the shield around together is a good example of how together they kind of need each other to 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 be that next that next um, generation of uh, of representatives for America and for the Captain America mantle, but. Obviously, only one person can wield the shield, and it has to be Sam now more than ever. And I'll talk about that in a second, too, why I think so even more after watching the episode. Um, but fighting John, it's clear that John has is either completely corrupted by the serum, or it's just who he's always been, and the serum's bringing it more out of him. And it's to actually have power like he does and to wield it. Uh, is corrupting him. Um, he just is. He he's convinced that he's Captain America, but he is completely just blind to what being Captain Captain America actually is or means. It's not like he knew Steve or, or really what Steve stood for or anything about Steve's values. He just knew what Steve did, and you know for his actions, and and that's it. It's not like he he knew Steve deeply. And personally, to understand what it means to wield that shield, like Sam or Bucky would know. So I think he's just 
he's kind of like regressing into this almost childish like mine 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 thing like it's mine it's mine it's mine like and i will do with it what i think is is right and, and what i'm supposed to do with it but what he's doing with it is clearly clearly just problematic problematic shit um and then he just it, it continues to sh he's Obviously, the pressure of wielding the shield has been building. I've been talking about that. In, you know, in every episode, it seems that John just can't handle the pressure of it, and 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 it just it it came to a boiling point, and now he feels betrayed, which he he really has no right to feel that way at this moment. For what he did is just, and I think in the beginning of the episode, he is kind of feeling it a little bit. Like I can't believe that I did that, but. But he doesn't accept or remorse, you know. He, he, he just he just kind of goes with it and and and, uh, and makes himself believe that it, it was the right thing to do, and that whatever I keep doing is going to be the right thing to do, because I'm Captain America. I'm ca he keeps saying it like I'm Captain America, and he's fucking tra he's like, when he, that whole battle is very important. It's the it's it's kind of like a it's a fight for for taking back what the shield actually means and what it's going to mean going forward because if it stays in his hands, John's hands, it's not going to be uh sir it's not going to be re the right represent representation of what the shield means. Um so it, it, that literal fight in the beginning is super important. Um yeah, and then from there, you know, John he just he can't handle uh that the people don't accept what he did. He can't handle it. And he lashes out again and again. He loses the rank and, and mantle of Captain America. And and now he's, uh, you know, in the comics, it's it's clear that he's he's heading towards the U.S. agent ma uh, moniker. Um, and there is a post credit scene, by the way, of him kind of getting ready to create that moniker a little bit. Um, I, I don't know that it's exactly what he becomes next. Because he still thinks he's Captain America. He's so convinced. So it's more like he's trying to create his own shield and be Captain America still. But he will become the U.S. agent. I'm sure that, depend, you know, who he ends up working for, too. And that's, where, that's what will bring me to the cameo. Now, when you say cameo, you're supposed to think like, okay, we've seen this person before. But we haven't seen this person before. It's actually interesting, though, because... Uh, First of all, Julia, Ju, Julie, Julia Louis Dreyfus, who, the great actress from television actress, um, Seinfeld, Veep, and you know film actress too. She's in plenty of Pixar movies and whatnot. Um, Julia Louis Dreyfus shows up, and I'm like, holy shit! I didn't even know she was playing a character in the MCU. Now she is, and it's an important character. I read up on the character a little bit, but. Um, that character was actually supposed to first appear in Black Widow. We have to remember some things about the shifting around of things because of COVID, too. Black Widow was supposed to be first. Uh, and that would have introduced this character that Julia Louis-Dreyfus plays. She's in the film. I think she's in the film when we see it in, in, in July. Um, and that was supposed to be the first time we see her. So that when she shows up in this, it's like, oh, shit. And that's kind of... So now we're being introduced to her here, and then she'll show up later. Um, and it's the character of... Contessa Allegra de la Fontaine, I think. It's a very long name. It's cool to have an Italian from Italy as, like, an important character going forward in the MCU. Because she is. Um, she's an Italian character. Uh, but she actually goes on to be important in the Nick Fury comics. Uh, she's actually also in the comics become... Lady Hydra, even though that's a moniker many characters have actually held. She well, she was at one point or another Lady Hydra, and Hydra, if you remember, is the, the um, opposite of S.H.I.E.L.D., or was the opposite of S.H.I.E.L.D. in a, a kind of a, a evil fascist organization. Um, and uh, and that is who we, we meet, and she's very clearly a, a figure of authority, the way she tells John that ah, I would have killed that I would have killed him too like she's just so like n not her 
immediately her views on things are very in line with with what you would expect from so literally it it, re, it it sounded very reminiscent of hydra so that doesn't surprise me but she's also like in the comics she's like a secret agent like she, she's skilled in combat she's a very like important integral character i think she'll probably be um the person behind where john's uh arc goes next probably in some way shape or form obviously she she wouldn't have approached him if, if it wasn't going to mean something for the future of both of their characters very curious to see what her role is in black widow too um um but yeah we so we just got to remember that too some things were meant to be revealed you know differently like I, I read something recently too about another character in another show or movie that was supposed to be revealed to us something there was something that was supposed to but i'm forgetting now so forget it um yeah and then the the episode just becomes very story oriented very plot plot plotty uh less action more plot more character um depth and whatnot uh, i think it's just it was great to have sam and Bucky, Sarah, and this whole family dynamic kind of thing happening. More growth between the two characters, you know, Sam and Bucky, to have them, their relationship, again, continue on to that next step and then becoming more of like a brotherly thing here. Um, and just them playing and, and jabbing at each other and joking around about how they're just co-workers and not really even friends but it's clear that they're becoming more friends every every day and every every mission that they're on together it's just very clear um and the way that they help each other too in this episode kind of see even more like what they should do you know helping each other see uh, pretty clearly what, what what their paths should be or what what choices they might need to make i think it's very clear when Sam tells Bucky, you got to, you know, serve somebody, you know, make somebody else feel better, not make yourself feel better by saying sorry to people. It's very clear to me that he'll, he will tell the man we met in the first episode, the, the, the old man that he, he hangs out with in, the, in that first episode in, in Brooklyn, um, blanking on the, the name of the character, but it was Mr. Something, and then, the, the, you know, how Bucky took that man's son that man is still suffering we saw it in the first episode he's still suffering over it that's it seems to me that's the clear setup we get here that he's going to tell that man what what he did and then try to provide some kind of closure like sam says someone needs closure that guy needs fucking closure so that was probably i mean that's an obvious setup to me and then this whole thing about Isaiah Bradley um, making it clear to Sam his perspective on, on the shield and what it means. And, uh, and especially what it means to black people in America. And how no self-respecting black man would, would wield the shield. But then it comes, and then it just comes down to Sam having to make a choice. And I love the way he makes the choice. You know, he makes it about how can I not wield this shield in honor of black people in America? How can I not take this shield and show people, like he says, I, I want to go out there and show people what we can be, what our people could be. And that's, this is the perfect opportunity for him to do that. Having a black man be Captain America, it is having a black, it has, it is having black people really cement what their service is to this country, what their purpose is in this country, what, what this country owes them. What, and Sam being Captain America is literally standing up for every, everybody in the black community and, and, and honoring the sacrifices, like he says. How can I not honor all the sacrifices, even that Steve made or that, or, or that um, as Isaiah made or anybody thus far? I think that there was a, it's a very loaded thing he says. It, it's very clearly about the black community, but it also could be about the Avengers too. Like all the sacrifices the Avengers have made, all the sacrifices that that Isaiah made, or that black people have made to 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 better uh, 
serve the commu- their community and to progress their community into a, a more f- free direction, more more equal direction, um, all the sacrifices that have been made. He honors those sacrifices by becoming Captain America. Now, it, it the way that it makes sense for him to become Captain America was the most powerful scene and moment. And having him train, finally, too, it just it embodied everything that came in this episode to, to end with that. To have him, he has to be, you know, and without super soldier powers, nothing, he has to embody the, almost has to, transcend what it means to be Captain America. He has to be better than than the idea, the current idea of what Captain America means. He has to bring it to this next level. This, this, this black man with no powers is going to be the best Captain America that this country needs right now, in this moment. And I think him, his training is really him becoming, like, just becoming even better than obviously better than John, but like trying to almost be better than Steve. Like there's this moment of him just trying to be not better than Steve, but just the best Captain America he can be. And when he finally just, he's just nailing it. He's, he's fine. He's the training with the shield and all. It's a wonderful scene that embodies the entire episode and brings us right down you know, you can ask, like, oh, what's in the case, too? What's in the case? But it's obvious what's in the case. And it's it's made of vibranium. And it's just like that shield. And it's very... I mean, even Steve's suits... It's a suit. Come on. Even Steve's suits towards the end of the Infinity Saga were weaved with vibranium, Kevlar, and whatnot. Like, so, like, it's very clear. Like, it's a Captain... Um, um, it's a... It's a suit. I don't. I'm not gonna like just blatantly be like it's a Captain America suit because it might not have the stars. It might not. It's, but it makes sense if it would, wouldn't it? D- definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely. I just, you know what? If it's if it if 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 the finale sees Sam in a, in a spangled star spangled suit, and even Bucky maybe having a new suit that. That embodies him as the White Wolf or something like we could have a serious setup for a potential second season where it's not even the Falcon and Winter Soldier anymore. It's Captain America and the White Wolf. They'll even change the title, potentially. Um, and I think uh, you know even Sam's little decisions here, little. I mean they're impactful. Him not taking the wings back. You know, in the comics, he he has the wings and the shield. I don't know that that's he. It, they could go a different way with his character in the MCU, and he just doesn't have wings anymore. He's legit Captain America. But we'll see what happens. Um, I think that's a huge moment in the episode, though. He just he keep keep them. He says in the, the the wings, no more. And it's kind of like a tr- it's a it's a growth a moment of growth from Falcon to Captain America in that moment too. In another way, um, I think the scene with Zemo and Bucky is very powerful too, because obviously Bucky's making better decisions, and he made the best decision too at this point to give uh, Zemo over to the only true justice there is at this at this point, and that's uh, that he belongs with, and he belongs in in a, the custody of. Of the Wakandans at this point, they should, they she said, uh, Ao said though that uh, we're gonna take him to the raft, and the raft is a prison for superpower people. We've seen it once in the films in uh, Captain America: Civil War. It's been mentioned in the Marvel Netflix shows, and uh, I think it was cool to have a mention here that that's where Zemo will be. It's very p- possible that's setting things up too, because if there are other s- Villains, <coughs> bless you, thank you. <laughs> if there are other villains at the raft in the comics, you know Zemo goes on to create uh, Masters of Evil or some title. I forget, but like a team of villains. 
But I think it's also just important. To, Zemo is so relatable as like a person that he, that it's what makes him such a great villain because he's not just p- straight, plain, pure evil. The way he stomps on the serum, he, like in that moment, he could have just been like, no, I'm taking the serum, but he fucking, he's just like a normal, his views are very, he's just, it's very, he's a very relatable character and it makes him a better antagonist because of it. He's not just straight an evil person, you know what I mean? He's not like an evil villain. Like he's, he has understandable motives, you know? And uh, it's crazy how they could make us care more about him in this series when he, we hated him for the things he did in Civil War, you know? And that's just good writing. Um, yeah, that's an important scene. I don't recall if Bucky ever teams up with Zemo in the comics. Again, I didn't read them, so I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I didn't read about that yet in any capacity. But, yeah. Yeah, just a very, very, very good episode. Um, I think last week's episode was like this peak episode. This week was like a calm before the storm kind of thing. So we we have the finale next week, and I can't wait to talk about it. If I forgot anything... what it is it's what it is that is my recap now we can deep dive into the MCU as a whole because the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision they're just the start of a next saga you understand this understand this uh, this much you know obviously that whole first 20 Two twenty three film, or I didn't, I never like to think of Far From Home, Spider Man Far From Home, as like an epilogue to the Infinity Saga. I I just don't think of it like that. I think Endgame is the end of that saga. You don't need an epilogue to it. It just it almost kind of it, it's it does the whole thing a disservice. You just need to end. It. Endgame is the end of the Infinity Saga. Far From Home always felt to me, like, even when I rewatch it, it feels like the start of this next saga. I, I don't care that, like, oh, uh, WandaVision now is this... It, I, it's not. Like, f- you know, Far From Home, yeah, it, it plays with the idea of a world without Tony Stark and what it means for Peter, so it can feel like an epilogue in that regard, but it's it, it's almost like that's things that are going to be explored anyway in this saga, a world without Tony Stark. And Armor Wars is going to be explored... In Iron Heart, it's going to be explored. You know th- these these upcoming stories and, and more Spider Man films. Like it's just Spider Man Far From Home. Even the way the post credit scenes kind of set up things that are clearly coming in this saga. It's and Spider Man's. By the way, the yeah, like the whole ending of Far From Home, Spider Man uh, and his big setup for whatever the fuck's going to happen to him in No Way Home, the next one. It's just, it's the start of the next cycle. Let's be real about that, okay? Um, but just the fact that uh, we're, we're into this one now, and it, 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 it's, it's bigger. You know, it's, it continues to somehow expand even more, and now they're coming out quicker, and there's more of them, more, there's more content. The fact that we've already had WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier within weeks of each other, like, it's been... The nonstop weeks since January of of this saga, and that's never happened before. We would get a movie, we'd wait three, four months. We'd get another movie, we'd wait six months. We'd get another movie. That's what it was. Now it's just constant, and it's like this. It's almost soap opery. It's like a soap opera in that regard. Like we're just constantly getting this story now. I think that is the way it's expanded now again and grown again. To think about where we've come from and now we're here is very, it's just, it's very, it's a, it's amazing. If the quality remains, it'll be even more amazing. I don't see why the quality couldn't either. I think, I think, I read, I saw like a, I saw someone say something somewhere once about like how the Mar- Marvel's too big to fail or something. And I thought to myself like, 
well, that's stupid. Things that are big fail. But I think what that person meant was just the uh, the scale of it and the working mechanisms of it are so like almost habitual and instinctual at this point. Everything doing its part, every person, every every little meeting, every little this, every little every, the filming of this, the writing of that, the, just the casting. The it's all like this mech, this machine now that it's almost like a like a like an artificial intelligence with obviously regular people running the show, but but it's like this big machine that can't really that almost can't fail because of the way that. I think, you know, the way that uh, Feige and his team of people continue to, to to very meticulously handle the the development of this this big giant mega narrative, and uh, I think the Disney Plus the, and the shows on Disney Plus, if anything, have have kind of been a way of combating the superhero fatigue by somehow by exposing us to more of it, um, but by Giving it his new feel and tone and style, too. Kind of helps with the fatigue that people thought might be coming. But it's it's just it's interesting to think about where we started and, uh, and where we come. And so I, I do find myself thinking about it as a, as a movement, a contemporary movement in cinema. And in order to understand how contemporary cinema has evolved, I think it is important to kind of look at uh, the superhero genre when talking about contemporary cinema, because superheroes are our modern mythology, right? Uh, and in examining the most popular and most successful superhero franchises, we, we can understand how superheroes have played a role in our developing society. Um, the MCU in particular is the, I hate to use that. I, I, I was going to say, by the way, that I'm not going to use the word franchise because I hate that fucking one and I already used it. Uh, I just don't like the terminology, you know, when it comes to something like, like it made sense in the past, you know, just these big blockbuster things. We throw them out. We make a whole bunch of money. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't. This is different because the quality is almost always good. I mean, I'm gonna just blatantly say that they that they are always good. Um, they're always good, and that's new because to have quality like this and be as big as it is, it kind of it puts people at it. They're kind of people are like I don't know how to term it. The terminology for the MCU is kind of like what do we what do we call this? You know, what is this? That's why I'm not calling it a franchise. I'm calling it. It's more than that. It's much bigger than that. It is. It's a movement kind of thing. Um, and what is it about the MCU that, that they have been able to maintain a, a success that other, you know, studios are simply unable to replicate? That's a big thing that you know just kind of been playing out over the years. You know, after Marvel's success, uh, just, we saw countless attempts to try to do this. Nobody could do it. Nobody's nobody's doing it. Nobody, and the, I, I mean, the DC Extended Universe and the uh, Universal's Universal's Monsters Universe are the two biggest failures at trying to replicate this. But uh, both are kind of finding their way of doing it their own way and and differently and whatnot. Um, and believe me, I realize I forgot to talk about the news. Which is usually first, but uh, I'll get to it after. I'll I'll just run through it kind of quick, and it'll be a quick because it wasn't really a lot this week. It'll be like a segment after the big topic here, so let's keep keep it going. I also want to make sure that I don't forget how to. That's got to keep moving. Um. So I think superheroes. Superhero cinema and and the evolution of it's important to talk about. I think um, because they are modern myths, you know. 
From comic books to the film medium, the superhero archetype has found its place in the hearts of fans and critics all over the country. In cinema, the superhero has been used to market blockbuster franchises for decades, but superhero films weren't artistically relevant while also generating commercial success until Tim Burton's Batman, I think, probably in 1989. For some, uh, for someone like me who didn't grow up reading the comics, my, my love for the genre came when I first saw an adaptation of it on screen in 2000, Bryan Singer's X-Men. You know, I often forget that X-Men was first, and it was the first thing that I saw. I forget that. I always thought it was Spider-Man, because maybe Spider-Man had more of an impact on me. I mean, they both did, Spider-Man and X-Men, but yeah, the Raimi trilogy of Spider-Man films was very impactful uh, personally on me, so I forget that X-Men was, uh, was first, but yeah, it was. The cinematic medium um, transformed me into a hardcore fan, like I mentioned, and uh, I think that automatically makes makes my my fandom in, more interesting in that regard. Um, yeah, recently superhero films have formed a new structure of storytelling and uh, it kind of there was like a shift. And when we think about like uh, the the different ages of superhero cinema, there was like pre X Men, right? Pre, pre Tim Burton's Batman, um, there was like the dark, the dark ages of it, kind of like the Dark Knight trilogy was like a very more, more uh, gritty, grounded, realistic take on things. Very, and then there was the shift immediately after, and started with with Iron Man in two thousand and eight, right? In two thousand eight, Marvel Studios made its mark in Hollywood because of the successful release of Iron Man. You know, Marvel Studios. It, really did bank a lot of its success. Uh, it it contributes all of its all of its success to Iron Man. Iron Man started everything, kicked it off, and we wouldn't even have what we have without that. Um, but uh, instead of adapting a hero story to the screen over a series of films, Marvel president Kevin Feige made it very clear that in two thousand eight, with the release of Iron Man. They were planning to launch an intertextual world and and telling the stories of multiple heroes across multiple interconnected films. Immediately different. Immediately nobody was doing that. Immediately the structure of that feels more televisual, right? Um, before 2008, studios generally made films about a single hero navigating through a very human world or in a contained series even if there was an ensemble cast as in the X-Men Iron Man starring Robert Downey Jr. directed by John Favreau that launched what would today be best known as the MCU and uh, the MCU is the first superhero universe to be abnormally consistent in its success as I mentioned in all different areas you know it's kind of the gold standard in Hollywood right now for storytelling, for, for blockbuster filmmaking and for superhero cinema. Um, I think, you know, I could talk about like the kind of evolution of it, but I think it's more important to just focus on the MCU at this point. Uh, that's kind of where I'll, I'll keep things. So, uh, when something becomes a cultural phenomenon, like they say, this has to be considered a cultural phenomenon. You know, I want in the Star Wars special, I talked about it too. You know how Star Wars is this? It, it was a it was a pheno- it was a cultural phenomenon that just like just took the whole country by storm, and then the whole world by storm. And it's not just the films; it's just the, everything that came from the films after the the cult cult uh, cult. What's it? cult cult nature of thing I don't know the I'm I'm blanking on some I will be a little bit cuz it's fucking late you know or early however you want to look at it it's fucking one of those things um <laughs> I think yeah I think uh I 
think the MCU is like the next Star Wars in that regard. It's the current cultural phenomenon. There's no, I don't think anyone would debate me on that, you know, the way it's taken the world by a storm. Um, it's hard for anything to be as big as Star Wars, right, in the way it, but Marvel has done this, and it just, there's a, there's an obvious here, the, the, the MCU's success and quality, and its ability to continuously do this, and keep this going, that's what Star Wars didn't do, right, uh, Star Wars didn't stay as consistent in quality, uh, it didn't keep quite the same, um, energy as the original trilogy when the prequel trilogy came out it's a, it was different you know and then the sequels were different i think this is just immediately just the way it feels like one thing and this the, the energy is the same the tone that everything is very consistent that is what makes it it could be bigger the fact that it, it you have to understand that where it's going to immediately puts it in contention to be the biggest thing bigger than Star Wars bigger than anything if it isn't already um, the MCU uh, I mean uh, it's the current height of superhero cinema just the way it incorporates all these different like new techniques that can that you know that become more influential than the superhero films that came before it. Superheroes have always had cultural relevance, but that relevance has changed and grown as the genre has evolved from medium to medium. While the comics are, are very you know, successful and effective all on their own, a shift to bring those distinct stories to a visual medium is important for understanding how the superhero fits into a changing technological world. You know, so immediately I think it was important for, I think it was important for Iron Man to start things off too, you know. Um, I think I think too when when Iron Man came out it was it was kind of directed at children right it was it was lesser known it was lesser known heroes they were you know Marvel was banking on this kind of appeal to children to make it successful um and then it ends up being very appealing to very to a wide range of audiences. Uh, but but Marvel, there's just there's nothing quite like what has become the golden age. It is the golden age. And it's interesting too, because because Iron Man came out in '08, and then the Dark Knight trilogy didn't end until after that. In fact, the Dark Knight trilogy ended a couple months after the Avengers came out in 2012. So that was that's so we had like kind of one age of superhero cinema ending, while another one was very much already in play with six films under the fucking, in, in the books and, and, and going. Um, so kind of the fact that they overlapped is interesting to me too. But another area where Marvel has excelled is in their ability to, uh, to apply, uh, identifiable qualities to all their characters. I think that's what really gets people every time. The way that we connect to all these characters, there's so many of them too, but we always seem to just love every new one we meet and it's like why are they all so distinct in their own way and it's it's something it really is to to give even superheroes humanity within this extraordinary universe of scenarios uh for instance in iron man 2 tony stark he, he he's disconnected from those close to him right because he's dealing with uh keeping a secret right he's, he's potentially dying uh, the device that keeps him alive is also killing him his symbiotic, uh, his symbolic, uh, death, his symbolic death is enacted through the, uh, distance he has with his loved ones and his responsibilities as Iron Man. Um, even the, even the structure, um, even the structure of the MCU is experimental in a number, a number of ways. The most culturally, 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 
Jesus. <laughs> uh, culturally relevant element is this like post 9-11 quality, right? So much so that the, uh, the entire universe is addressing the issues of the war on terror throughout the, the narrative arcs. I think a lot of, a lot of times this comes up, um, both aesthetically and thematically. Um, it's just it's like all a, a great deal of the films I think Iron Man and Captain America the Winter Soldier probably are the, the ones that strongly address the issues of government conspiracy war terror it's it's the universe's ability to embed these ideas within uh, lightly toned narratives that makes the films effective these techniques have allowed for an impact that has resonated with audience at a deeper level. Um, when merged with effective marketing strategies, too, uh, the financial outcome is stellar. Absolutely stellar. Uh, it's just this kind of idea of good and evil, this very strict view of good versus evil. It, it's very post 9 11 y to, you know, it's kind of just. It's just the way the world, the way America sort of saw things. And I think the, the MCU very much tackles this effectively. We always see that, that divide. We get very strain, uh, strain, plain and strict, strictly clear good guys and bad guys. Bad guys are always some kind of, in the Iron Man films, especially to this terrorist group that Tony has to deal with or something. And Captain Morton, it, it Captain America, it's it's more of a, in terms of within, you know, within the country, within the government. It's conspiracy theories, big one there. Um, and shadow organizations, something, you know, the, the idea of conspiracy theories was, you know, just kind of a big thing that took off after 9-11. Uh, so Captain America deals with that. Makes it a big part of their stories. Um, the marketing strategies, I mean, they're a process. And, uh, and they're just, I mean, within that process comes marketing ploys to draw in audiences and keep them coming back for more. I think um, the MCU. Is uh, it has an exceptionally exceptional ability to achieve box office success while at the same time receiving praise for, from both fans and critics for making brilliant films, and that that is it truly separates from other. Here's that word again: franchises. Um, however, there are those who believe the MCU formula is on the verge of wearing out. Right? People keep saying, the, and I just mentioned, there's the chance of fatigue. Right, I still believe that the Disney Plus shows have invigorated some kind of new life into this. The, the fatigue, the, that's how that, that was, that was Foggy's way of, of, of making sure it didn't happen. We'll see if it holds, we'll see if it, if it rings true or not, if it holds up. Um, I even think, that, I even think that Foggy's been fighting that well before. You know, he's always taking risks and trying new things and trying to tell something, some new story or sub, try some new tone or new genre. Guardians of the Galaxy was a good example. Huge risk, totally different kind of movie. And nobody was looking at it like some superhero movie. You know, it was totally different. It was actually more similar to Star Wars than it was to Marvel. It was Marvel's Star Wars, if you will. And, that's, and that film was another way at the time of keeping things fresh and new. And I think he's... I think WandaVision is the most recent example. It, it was completely different from anything we've seen. So how can you get tired of seeing the same thing, right, when it doesn't feel like the same thing? Always Marvel's giving us those things we want to keep seeing, but with new life and new ideas and new approaches to those things. Um, and, you know, as the years go on, the MCU... It's it's just gonna keep the new strategies. It, it it's just it's crazy, man. Crazy stuff. Um, 
and I think many studios in Hollywood, they're just kind of rethinking the way that they make movies. And of course, now we have to talk about the whole big difference now. And the big difference now is that we live in a post-COVID world. So what does, what does blockbuster cinema even look like post-COVID? Because that, you know, for years it's been, Marvel's been king. And they can't even, they can't even release their films the way they used to do it. It's just not the same, and it's definitely not gonna. If anyone can, it's almost. I've been. I've kind of been predicting that it's possible the MCU is what saves the movie theater business. You know, as soon as things can really be, people are gonna be rushing to the theater to see Black Widow. They're gonna be rushing to the theater to be to see Shang Chi, to see Eternals. To, Marvel is the the machine that changed blockbuster cinema. And now it's going to have to be the machine that saves blockbuster cinema and just, I suppose, movie going in general. Um, but just, it's, it's, if you don't believe me, just keep in mind Marvel made $10 billion in eight fucking years. Ten billion dollars in eight years. That's more than that's more. That's that's more than a billion. Yeah, that's more than a billion a year if you look at it like that. Yeah. So people want to see these movies. People want to watch the shows. I think the shows are very clever. It's a very clever strategy with Disney Plus because. They kind of like they're their own thing, but they're very much like just like they're stirring the pot, you know. They're they're just kind of teasing us for what the next movie could be, the next big team up could be. The, I think that that's it's it's all a strategy, man. It's that's what it is. It's a strategy to to really just bring new life and keep things interesting. Oh. Yeah, I definitely, I, I would keep an eye out for how things go when the uh, movie theaters reopen because we could very much be relying on Marvel to to bring things back around again, you know. It's, they could make things normal again with just one, with, with just two movies in theaters, you know. Black Widow, Shang-Chi, they come out and all of a sudden, boom. Who the fuck knows, man? Um, and I just, I... I think before, even before the Disney Plus shows, there was an approach to Marvel's television that's that was very brilliant in its in and of itself. You know, Feige now has a direct hand in things when it comes to the TV side. Before he didn't as much, but even then, his 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 spirit and his touch was still felt when we got the Netflix shows when we got. You know, even just even Agents of Shield or Agent Carter or you know those shows, all of them, even the Netflix shows, everything. There's still that feeling of of what the MCU is and feels like, the interconnectivity of things, the the kind of trying to change it up with different kind of genre, subgenres, tones. I, I think um, you know there was there was definitely something something to be desired. No, that's the wrong terminology. <laughs> that's that's implying that they they need to do better, right? Yeah, it's very desirable to to think about those shows and to watch those shows and to think about the potential future of of those characters because we were introduced to characters that we very much care about and want to see again. You know what I mean? I'll I'll keep saying it. I'll always say it. Iron Fist is underrated. I uh, I I just recently finished watching the second season of that, which was vastly better than the first season. And uh, how can you have Colleen Wing now wield the power of the Iron Fist and not want to see what happens? Forget about if you like Danny or not. I like Danny, but I understand why people don't. He's very, like, hard to like. He's not as likable, but I like him, but... 
Colleen is, is really the character I, I really like when I watch that show. And Colleen, uh, she's fucking wielding that power. And you, I, when you want to see what happens, Feige, he, he brought it up recently. He talked about how there are plenty of fans of these shows that want to know what happens. He's got plans. He's got fucking plans for these characters. He's got to. And we'll just keep bringing it around to the potential rumors that Matt Murdock's going to be in the next Spider-Man and leave it at that. And if he is, I'm going to... As Deadpool would say, I'm going to have to remember to wear my white pants to the theater. <laughs> I don't even remember if he says that at all in the movies, but I just said it. Um... I also think the MCU always does a good job of addressing current social and political issues. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is the best example of that right now. I just mentioned it in the recap again and again. I keep talking about it. But uh, even way back in, in, early on with Iron Man, like the addressing of technology in America and, and, it's, and it's like very rapid, you know, progression and evolution. Um... Iron Man did that very well. Captain America, the first Avenger, um, talked about like uh, this idea of a foreign, you know, very embodied the idea of a foreign evil, which is very obviously reminiscent of Hitler. So that's a World War II period film, obviously. Again, genre mixing is a good thing to talk about when we talk about the MCU too, because they all have their own kind of subgenre, as I, I briefly said there. Uh, Couple, couple of minutes ago, like it's you know, if the first Avengers a uh, period film, um, Guardians of the Galaxy is a comedy, Ant Man's a heist movie, uh, Iron Man's a straight up action movie. I could you can go all day probably if you think about it. Thor is a fantasy film. Captain Marvel is sci-fi, right? Uh, I suppose you could say Guardians of the Galaxy is sci-fi. I don't know. Ragnarok, Jesus. That is still the most... <laughs> that's still one of the the most unique of all. It's the most unique one besides Guardians of, of just in the whole... I... I it's in that's in my top five. I'll I'll talk about my rankings soon. I'm almost done talking about this, but and I'll do my rankings. But yeah, just the, the idea of them all having these subgenres, and then in these subgenres, each subgenre has this ability to address very important social and political issues that are going on in in, in our country and in the world. Even um, it, it's I think. When we talk about it as being a movement, this is what I mean. You know, when it does these kind of things, this gives them a place within the conversation of cinema um, and that allows it to potentially be remembered as a film movement. Uh, Marvel, for a while there, was slow when it came to its progressiveness, right? And now look at where we are. So, you know, we, we had Black Panther, we had Captain Marvel, we... We have the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We had WandaVision. We, and we're going to continue to go in this direction. I mean, we have... We have we're, we have a potential passing of the torch between Natasha and Yelena in Black Widow. We have uh, the passing of the torch potentially in Thor with a female Thor. We have... Um, we've met characters now that have become extremely integral, like Monica Rambeau. We've... Uh, we got, um, I mean, just the lineup here. Yeah, the lineup's been really good. It's going to get better. We got Shang-Chi coming. Progressiveness is, it, it's vastly better. I remember where we were a few years ago, and it's its like, there's very slow moving with this, and now it's its getting much better in that regard, too. Um, And I just, I do want to talk about the genre 
mixing of things just a little bit, right? I think because it gives them it gives them a place in every the fact they have a place in every genre just embeds Marvel Cinematic Universe into all of cinema. You have a film in all these genres. One film in, in each genre or two films, five films in each genre. You're really fi- you're really embedding yourself a place in cinema as like this huge impactful thing. Because it's like think of it you have to think it's Marvel Studios, right? So if it's a studio, like other studios, studios put out multiple films a year in multiple different genres. Marvel somehow does the same thing, but all in one large narrative. They're all connected. They're all superhero movies, but they're all also these other movies. They allow, they, they're able to stay independent while also connected to a larger story. It, it's unfucking real when you think of it like that, huh? Um, particularly useful approach to genre for understanding how genre works and evolves with, with time. I think to think about like semantics and syntax is a good way to think about it. I'll even quote Rick Altman. Uh, Generic definitions that depend on a list of common traits, attitudes, characters, shots, locations, sets, they, all these little things, that's, they stress the, the semantic elements that make up the genre, which gives us relationships that might be called the genre's fundament, fundamental syntax. So he suggests, if I'm putting this in, in, into the conversation of the MCU, he's talking about merging one genre's semantics with another's syntax. This is what Marvel does. Genres evolve and new genres form. This is a way genre innovation happens. It's happened forever in, in cinematic history. We've seen it all, all. We see it all the time. The superhero film followed a similar layout to the comics in terms of the semantics and its syntax. With that being said, referring to um, the three eras of the modern comic book movie, we can see where filmmakers have began experimenting with the superhero genres as, you know, as like, as, as they did with other genres. Um, like The Dark Knight is a good example, obviously. Uh, this idea of its brooding realism. Um, I think uh, while films like The Dark Knight get down to a dark tone, gritty realism, it also played with the semantics and syntax of the superhero genre and allowed other genre elements to impact the final product. Thus, it can be a crime film, or it can be a superhero movie. It paved the way for how the MCU would play with the genres. Different films mold them into their particular style. Throughout this section of of talking about genre, I just want to talk about how the MCU does this. Um, kind of like part of their formula to play with different genres. So, uh, for instance, for instance, Marvel Studios is incorporating kind of like their own vision into a superhero film, straying away from some of the typical conventions of the genre. This is something all genres go through. It's kind of like how uh, Western films evolved, right? Or how Star Wars kind of merged sci-fi with uh, Western and it gave us the space Western, which is kind of like what Guardians of the Galaxy is, right? In some ways. Um, Iron Man, which fits the semantics and syntax of the conventional superhero film, it also... um, progresses past those conventions. Iron Man did, what Iron Man did was lay the foundation for the MCU, but supplementing the MCU style and rules into uh, to future films. So that's kind of, you know, Iron Man created the semantics syntax of what the MCU is, and they have thus 
they have continued to be incorporated into the formula for every MCU film that followed all the way up till now, right? Um, so there's kind of like the MCU semantic syntax, and then we have other genre semantic syntax, and then there's the merging of them. Marvel does this brilliantly, very, very brilliantly. Um, yeah, so I think uh, culturally, artist artistically, the MCU has strategies for generating commercial success. And central strategy is how the universe as a whole has been envisioned. But I wonder, um, yeah, I wonder if we'll look back at the Marvel style. If we look back on the Marvel style. And, and will we see it being incorporated into other films that are outside of Marvel Studios? That's interesting to think about. If we can run down the list, what are the genres? What are the genre m mergings and mixings that Feige played with? I kind of like. I would like to kind of think about it for a second. What is each film? Iron Man action, uh, typical superhero movie. Captain America is a period piece. Uh, the Incredible Hulk is, that's kind of like a regular superhero movie. So is Iron Man 2. So they didn't really do it too much. Thor's a fantasy. Avengers is this, Avengers is like a, Avengers might be a sci-fi. Yeah, Avengers is more of a sci-fi. Like this team-up sci-fi thing going on. It's interesting to think about what each genre is. I think it really got good too with uh, Captain America: The Winter Soldier, which is very much like a political thriller, and that that set the tone for what we now know to be that that corner of the MCU, that cornerstone that I always talk about. And that's like Civil War was that, and uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier is that. Um, Ant Man was the heist movie, right? Ant Man: The Wasp. Black Panther, kind of like a foreign film, <laughs> taking us to another country. I don't know. It's it's interesting to think about. Maybe I'm way off. I don't know. I don't think I am, but there's definitely a difference in genre. I think with each project, there's there's a there's a difference. But it, always comment below. Okay. In the comments below, tell me what you think. What's, what do you, do you think that Marvel feels the same all the time, or does it feel different because it tries to tackle different tones and feels and genres? Go ahead. That's what it's there for. That's what it, it's there for. But Marvel, I mean, when the MCU was first established, right? It made sense to set up a conventional superhero in a, in a world where his abilities were rare and responsibilities small, personal, and ethical. Iron Man is the conventional hero's journey and it is structured as such. Narrative is a huge part of this, obviously. Narrative is the one area of the MCU where art and money coexist effectively. The strategies are not purely artistic or purely commercial. They are a combination of both. They start with a uni perspective, right? Meaning one individual hero is the focus and his development changes as he continues on his journey. Iron Man, of course, was immediately established to exist in, in a larger universe. And so from the moment the MCU's first ever post credit scene had Nick Fury reveal the vastness of the universe, that was the day the Marvel Cinematic Universe was born. Mm -hmm. And since then, it has been more of a televisual structure. It has been more of a very long-form story. I mean, you could think of it as three acts of a movie, right? Um, you could. Phase one was act one, phase two was act two, phase three was act three. And in that regard... It has all these little plot points within, right? With uh, each big movie being the conclusion of those acts. 
of those, yeah, of those acts, the like big plot points at the end of the phases. Um, but the narrative device that has been recently necessary for the continuing expansion of the universe is the crossover connectivity concept. I think what's been cool, too, is to see the evolution of that. First, it would be like you'd never see the characters together. And then the Avengers finally brought them together. And then they didn't get together again for a while, and then they came together. But then you'd have solo films with two characters that you know really well together, or three characters that you know really well. And then Civil War brought everybody together into Captain America's movie. So the evolution of that, and then it's just going to continue to go in that direction. We've seen it even in the shows now, too, uh, how people have popped in. And I think that's just going to get even bigger, um, the kind of characters that just show up in the solo films. It's almost never solo anymore, but then the writing manages to stay very, like, this is about this character. You know, Civil War was a Captain America movie, even though it had all these characters in it. I think that's what's really effective. That was a big, like, debate at the time. Of, like, is this an Avengers movie, or is this a Captain America movie? And I think it very much remains a Captain America movie, while also kind of at the same time being an Avengers movie. So that evolution is very cool to look at. Um, and I don't ever think that uh, this thing's this beast that we call the MC is gonna just simply slow down. It's, it's too successful. It's just too goddamn successful, man. You know, in five years, I want to be watching. I want to be watching the. Uh, this next saga, you know, I want to be binging it like I do the Infinity Saga, and uh, just be, just continue to be highly entertained, just highly, highly entertained. Can't ever pretend that the characters don't greatly affect us when we watch this, watch their evolutions. We can't ever deny that the stories manage to change. And evolve in new and fresh, effective directions. And we can't deny that Feige and his team continue to uh, completely surprise us with the new risks they take. The MCU is, and Marvel Studios, is all about taking risks. It's always been about trying something that nobody would expect to succeed. It all started in that regard. Iron Man was a risk. Guardians of the Galaxy was a risk. And, uh, the Eternals coming out is a risk, and I'm, I mean, taking the Disney Plus approach was a risk. I think these risks risks have paid off and then some. So I trust in Feige. When people say, "I don't know what the fuck's gonna," do, look at what the guy has done. I mean, there hasn't even been, there hasn't been one single rotten MCU movie on Rotten Tomatoes. I think the average score for all 23 films plus the shows is probably like an 87%. And that's a lot. That's high for 25 projects so far. So have some faith. Have some trust. And just see where this, this thing goes, man. I, uh... I want. I would love to keep going. I could talk all day about this. I really could, but I. It's. It's a lot, man, and it's. It's a. It'd be a long show. So we have to move on. We have to wrap this up. We also have to wrap it up because for me, it's two thirty in the morning, and and I want to like like sleep probably. But I'm not like super tired either because I like drank a coffee a couple hours ago, so I'm not like dying to jump in my bed. I knew this would be a hell of a day. I came into it with these expectations. I'm keeping it going. It's all Marvel themed for the Marvel Cinematic Universe special episode 50 of Screen Preach. Let's keep it going with a couple of segments and then we'll wrap this thing up. It's been fun. Uh, obviously, I gotta get to the news of the week. It, we're going in a different order this week, but whatever. 
because uh, I missed it. So we'll do that right now. Here's the news of the week. I'm going to start with my, my, the biggest thing that I saw. and uh, I didn't post it anywhere. I didn't put it up anywhere. Nothing like that. Okay, But I just saw it today. Amazon's Lord of the Rings series to cost $465 million for just the first season. That is insane. That tops even what Marvel has done. I think WandaVision costs $250 million, which is also insane, it's like a blockbuster movie. But this is a series on Amazon. This is Disney Plus series, Amazon's costing this much money is just exponential. This is when, when we talk about what TV is and how it could be the, the new standard for cinema. This helps that argument become more concrete. You know, people, especially in a post-COVID world, would stay at home and have no problem watching things right here, not going out, not do. Television has just swept over. I mean, right now, too, nobody's going to the theater, so TV is the standard. The question is, will it remain and become the actual standard? And when you have when you have shows costing this much money, which is the budgets for like big blockbuster movies, it's it's really it's really unbelievable to hear that. I can't imagine what this epic is going to look like. I, I I'm glad they're doing it. I can't wait for this. I, I want to see this. Uh, we have to respect what Peter Jackson did, not touch it too much, and do something original and new and fresh and unique here we can't you know there will never be anything quite like that masterful trilogy and now we you know you want to do something that's your own here in that same world of middle earth i'm i'm all for it i'm very, this makes me even more intrigued if something if if an if a season of television can cost that much money and it's streaming on amazon prime it's it's fantastic it's really something. Really something. And that's one season. So think about what the whole series is going to cost if they do like f- five seasons of this. It'd be like $2.5 billion or something. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe more. Um, what else did we see? Also today, or I guess yesterday now, Helen, McC- Helen McCrory, uh, the actress Helen McCrory died of cancer, and I didn't even know she had cancer. I don't know if anyone did, but it was just like whoa, out of nowhere. Like, are you, wow, like that was first. Was, I mean, it's crazy to see some of the the the, the stars that are passing away because, especially when we see them in things consistently, and, and it's just like now they're just gone. It's like. And we'll see them in a couple things, and they'll they'll be gone. Like that always happens. You see them in something that they already filmed. I'm curious about Peaky Blinders because she plays uh, Polly Gray in Peaky Blinders, a huge character in that series, one of the greatest series of all time. Peaky Blinders, honestly. Um, and they're supposed to be, you know, there's the final season filming, and there's supposed to be a movie. I, I'm curious what happens with her character. She was in Harry Potter. She played Malfoy's mother. She she's a she was a very special talent, and it's sad to hear because she wasn't that. She was just she was I think she was fifty two years old. Like it's sad, you know. Um, rest in peace. Uh, and then there's a rumor going around about Marvel creating a Wolverine anthology series for Disney Plus. Just a rumor, not fact. But I wanted to talk about it. I was gonna. T- I was also when I saw this, like, it was like, oh, there's gonna be a cameo this week in Falcon. We're just, I was like, I was. I wasn't thinking it's gonna be fucking Wolverine, but like, maybe a hint to him or something. And then I was really gonna talk about this in depth and how it could be really cool. But hey, anthology means what? That it takes place over multiple eras, maybe, because that makes sense for Wolverine's character. I think also. If Wolverine is the character that brings mutants into the MCU, that would be the coolest thing. Because what if he's the first? What if he's the first mutant and he was he was born decades ago? He doesn't know he's even fucking 
a mutant as it's, he's, and he's been kind of just laying low, not doing anything, because that's what he is. He's a loner type person, and it would make sense for him to create, be be influ- You know, what if like he's like the, they change it in the MCU, and he's like how mutants come, come to life here, like, and then like when and you could like literally have like Charles be a kid. But then Charles grows. Charles and, and Eric grow up, and then Wolverine's going to be the same fucking age, you know. Like he doesn't. Need, it's interesting to think about it like that. It's a possibility. If anyone could be around and be a mutant the whole time, it would be Wolverine. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick. It is not fact. Do not take that. You know. Um. I put this up on Instagram. Predator, the, the original Predator film, and the, the screenwriters who wrote it are going to go to war with Disney in a legal battle for the rights to the franchise. Um, again, using that word, I don't fucking like using franchise. <laughs> this is interesting to me because if it's a matter of money, you should just try to find a way to make a deal and allow Disney to do so. Because unless you're going to take the rights and make a new story in that world or, or to start writing new movies in, the, in that world, I, why not let Disney have a stab at it? I, I'm curious to see what Disney would do with the uh, Predator stories. They have a lot of IP now. When they, they bought Fox, they just have everything. They're going to do Planet of the Apes again. They have Planet of the Apes IP. They, I think they have Indiana... I think they're even Indiana Jones. Like, they just have everything. And I don't... I, I'm curious to see them take a stab at things because they are going to take new directions. They're going to break down their barriers of not releasing things in rated R. They're going to do that now. Like, they just have to, to evolve because they have all this IP that... They can't just limit themselves to PG-13 and, and make it... They have to... There's going to be a lot of things that they do. I'm curious. And Predator would be one of those things I'm curious to see them do. So I just thought it'd be interesting to bring that up. Uh, Game of Star... Uh, Game of Star... Game of Thrones star, Pilo As Asbiak. Asbiak. He played uh, Urine Greyjoy in Game of Thrones. He has just joined... Um, wow, this fucking thing does not want to bring it up. Bring it up. He joins Aquaman sequel. That's right. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's coming. Soon enough. Gabriel Luna joins HBO's The Last of Us, playing Tommy, the character of Tommy, I think. Gabriel Luna, of course, you would know from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He played Ghost Rider in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Still waiting for him to come back, too. That's another character. Quake. These are characters that need to show up in the MCU again. Um, Indiana Jones 5 has casted Mads Milkinson. Here's a guy who was replacing Johnny Depp in the Fantastic Beasts films. And now he's in, Di- in, in, in Indiana Jones 5 opposite Harrison Ford. Wonder who he's playing. No idea. No details on who he could be playing. But that was interesting to see. And... Uh, this was heartbreaking to see this week. I put it up. I was I also I, I couldn't find a way to I didn't want to change my link in the, the, there's still a, there's still a petition out right now to uh, to save the Arclight. So Arclight theaters, Pacific theaters, uh, Cinerama Dome, they're closing like for good because of COVID. And this is ridiculous, dude. Do you know how historic the Cinerama Dome is on Sunset? And it's just going to close down. If anything, that theater alone should be saved. Just that theater. Don't worry about the whole chain and everything. That theater needs to stay open. I don't... This is insane, dude. When I heard this, I wanted to cry. And I've only been... I've only lived here for a year. I've only been there five, six times. And I love that theater. I loved it immediately. I love it. And it needs to stay open. Do you understand that this is... This just can't happen, dude. So there is a petition I signed it. I donated to it. It, it's just, it needs to fucking stay open then. I don't care how they do it. But somebody's got to step in. This thing can't close. Just can't. I don't even want to think about that. Let's not even talk about that anymore. Lucy Liu joins New Line and DC's Shazam sequel. Fury of the Gods. She's playing the villain. Don't think, don't know who the villain is in the movie, but she's playing the villain. 
Soprano star Joseph Saravo dies. There's another one. He he played um Tony's father in all the flashbacks of the Sopranos. He also played John Gotti in a movie recently. He played uh he's just he's you would know him if you saw him. He's pretty known for the most part. Small time actor. But rest in peace. And then just talking about how we go forward here in a post-COVID world and everything with theaters and movie and cinema and the movie business, it's important to note this. Godzilla vs. Khan did make $350 million at the box office this past week, and it's, it has now reached that and has now probably gone over that, too. It's something, man. You know, it's less than it used to be, but it's, it's something. You know, a movie like that should have at this point been well close to a billion obviously not necessarily making a billion but like you know high 700 million so i would think something like this would make 600 million some so you know we're getting there it's good i just this that was good to see and i had to bring it up just to see some movements so hope hopefulness hopefulness um, so yeah, dude, yeah, I think, uh, I wonder if I'm loud, dude, it's fucking late, man, I wonder if I'm loud, let's do a, let's do a, our segment, so our segments this week are all Marvel themed, and it starts with things that I did in the past for specials I want to do here. First of all, I want to rate all of the MCU films. Um, this is my list. This is my breakdown of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and what I think is from best to worst. This is my list. We can it's we can let's debate it. You can comment below. We can talk about. I'm gonna go for it here, and it's hard. The first three I could have put in any order. Okay, let's be clear about that. But. Avengers Endgame, a 9.7 out of 10. Because to me, it is the ideal, quintessential, the perfect kind of... It is, it is a it is the perfect superhero movie. It really is, dude. All the way through, man. Just masterful superhero cinema. 9.7 out of 10. Black Panther... 9.6 out of 10 because it tackles super important themes and issues but also the characters are extremely compelling and it gave us one of the best villains in the MCU and possibly in just in movies with Killmonger because he's super relatable Captain America the Winter Soldier 9.5 out of 10 that one is it could easily have been number one on this list Changed everything, I think, in the MCU. Big turning point, story-wise, but also tone-wise, style-wise, genre. Uh, very, very impactful film in plot and, and plot and character-wise, but also the way it tackled uh, super important socio-political themes. Again, political thriller, just an amazing political thriller. Um, Avengers Infinity War 9.3 out of 10 because it's an epic that kind of going off of Avengers Endgame it, it, by extension just almost perfect in terms of superhero cinema so I have to give it a 9.3 out of 10 it's, it's number 4 on my list and then yeah I knew it Thor Ragnarok is in my top five. Thor Ragnarok is number five. Mm. It is 9.2 out of 10 because it is the most unique in my opinion. It is the funniest mm. in my opinion. It cracks me up. And it was the best evolution of Thor's character. Mm. So, 9.2 out of 10. Then Captain America Civil War, 9.0 out of 10. Really, again, for similar reasons that the Winter Soldier was great, but also for reasons why the Avengers movies are great. 
also the way it introduces new characters and allows them to have their moments, very impactful moments, even just even Spider-Man's quippiness or Black Panther's super serious um, uh, grief in that film and what he's going through. Um, then Spider-Man Homecoming, 9.0 out of 10 as well, just because I'm a huge Spider-Man fan and I thought that was the best kind of justice done to the character. It was really something to see that incarnation of the character get a film like that. Teenage Peter Parker, and it felt like it felt right, man. So I got to put that in there next. It's a 9.0. The Avengers, the first Avengers after that, because it changed everything, and it was the first time we'd ever seen anything like that. And it was building to that too. We were we were waiting for that one, and it and it did it did so well at, at exceeding our expectations. We could look back on it now and be like, it was not as good as maybe like. Well, yeah. Well, look at what it what's topped it. Look at what look at what we have now because of it. But still, at the time, it was just totally different than anything, and. That's why also also a 9.0 out of 10. So, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, then Guardians of the Galaxy, because it was, again, risk, but totally worth it. Totally different from all the other ones. Had to be in there. Had to be in there, you know, in my top 10, easily. 8.9 out of 10. Um... Then to finish off my top ten is Iron Man because I, I how can I not have the one that started it all in there and I know you're gonna be like and I give that an eight point nine out of ten as well but you know, you're gonna be like how's that not in the top five or how's that not number one because look at what look at what it gave us it it gave us films that topped it like it was supposed to do right. So that's why, obviously, it's in my top ten, but it's not the best one. It gave us ones that are better. That's what it did. It started it all, and it gave us ones that are better. It's still amazing. And 8.9. Now let's see where the, the other half is here. I'm putting the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I'm putting the shows in here. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is next on my list. I give it an 8.7 out of 10 right now. Because it's super, it's super relevant and sh- it's, it's that same feel that I love from the MCU, that political thriller cornerstone, that grounded, gritty, earthbound kind of thing going on here. Very personal and real and human things going on in this, in this series right now. And I, 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 I love it. And it's, it's, it's number 11 on my list with an 8.7. Fucking fight me on it, dude. Spider-Man Far From Home, 8.6 out of 10. Great sequel to the first one, but also a great epilogue to Endgame and a great setup to the next saga. All those things. Also, really good evolution for Peter, you know, growing beyond Tony, but also becoming more Spider-Man, really, in that one. You know, that whole uh, climax, really. 8.6... Then WandaVision, because it was like nothing I'd ever seen, and it was, it made me cry. <laughs> it made me cry. It's number 13 on my list because it's that good. And 8.6 out of 10. The only reason it's below the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is because the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is more my taste. That's all it is. It's a matter of taste. Everyone has their thing they like more in the MCU. Again, talking. To, to support my argument about genre mixing in the MCU and how they do it. They definitely do it, and they do it effectively. Everybody, everybody has something they like more or, or in, in the MCU, more or less. Um, Doctor Strange, 8.5 out of 10. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, 8.5 out of 10. Sequel that I enjoyed, but but I mean it's that one I had to move up to. I had it lower, I think. I had to move it up though. It's just too good. It's too good. 
Um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, 8.3 out of 10. Uh, the introduction of that character, the Wasp, I love. Avengers Age of Ultron, not as hated as people, other people might hate. And that's next on my list with an 8.1 out of 10. Uh, actually, not a terrible sequel for the Avengers to, to re-team up again after not seeing them together for a while. That wasn't terrible. Really wasn't. I enjoy it more. It's better, I think, than you think, too, if you rewatch it. Then Captain Marvel, 8.0 out of 10. Uh, people don't like that one at all, dude. People put that at the bottom of their list. I like that movie. I like Carol. I, I just, I like the whole vibe coming. I think the sequels will be better, too, obviously. I just think they'll figure out more what her stories are supposed to be. Um, so 8.0 out of 10. Ant-Man, 8.0 out of 10. Funny, cool, little intro. Just nothing crazy about that movie, you know, so it's lower down on the list. Iron Man 3, 7.9 out of 10. Because it, uh, I still love it, but it, it's kind of just like a goofy Christmas movie almost. <laughs> but it tackled some really, like, it, it got deep and dark, but it didn't quite conclude the way you wanted it to, right? Maybe not as much. 7.9. Captain America, the first Avenger, 7.8 out of 10. I still love it, but it had a, cor a kind of corniness to it that the other ones totally blew away. Like, the other two Captain America movies blow that one away. So, in terms of that trilogy. And yeah, it's one of the less, it's one of the weaker ones. It has to be at the bottom. It's hard to put any of them, like, but it's, it is. Um, Thor, 7.8 out of 10. Good, still kind of, you know, it's still fun, but it's, it's nothing special at all. Iron Man 2, 7.5 out of 10. Yeah, it's, you know, when you rewatch it too and keep rewatching it, it doesn't live up to, it just doesn't. The problem is it never lived up to the first one, and that that's really what it was. Um, so 7.5 out of 10. The Incredible Hulk, 7.5 out of 10 as well. Uh, for obvious reasons. It never felt like it fit because we had to recast Bruce Banner and... And it wasn't like a, it wasn't anything special either. And then Thor: The Dark World, in my opinion, is the worst. It's just it's it's okay. I won't say it's bad because it's hard for me to say that about the MCU in, at all ever. Seven point three out of ten. It's okay, you know. It's okay. It's hard for me to get over the fact that there was a spaceship that fell into London and Thor was the only one there fighting it after they all teamed up to fight aliens in the Avengers. That just never made sense to me. How no one else could show up in that movie to help him. It was kind of a big, it would kind of be a big deal if all of a sudden again there was an alien spaceship right after what happened. That always bothered me about Thor the Dark World. Always. It just didn't work for me, man can't do that shit doesn't work <laughs> doesn't work um and that's you know that's that um I might just I'm super worried about my phone dying. That's all that was. Um, sucks now. I'm going to have to cut that up. I'll also talk about my watch order. Yeah, I did it with Star Wars. There's a way I watch these. And I thought I'd do it again here. <laughs> You're going to love the way I do this. Uh, but before I do, I just want to bring up real quick that the comics are important. And they're fun. And I have read them. I've read Red Hulk because I wrote a Red Hulk film. So I did a lot of research and I read the Red Hulk arc and the Thunderbolts arc. They're fun. So there's arcs that I think, and this goes for me too, that you should maybe check out and that I'll check out. I thought I'd run down my basic list of of Avengers of Marvel comics that you should, and that I should read. 
just a, a list of the top ones, right? There's Avengers Forever. There's Ultron Unlimited. There's Under Siege. Obviously, Civil War. Then there's the Young Avengers. I, I forgot that I had a Patriot action figure as a kid growing up and always thought it was the coolest one. And then I remembered when I saw the cover of this. That's Eli Bradley leading the Young Avengers. And we may have seen him in the Falcon and Winter, in the Winter Soldier. I can't wait to see that costume on screen. Forgot all about that costume and that character and that action figure. And Patriot's a cool, cool looking character. Young Avengers is going to be cool to read and cool to see in the MCU. The Korvac Saga. The Kang Dynasty, which many have predicted that Kang the Conqueror will be the big bad of this next saga. We'll see if he is. House of M, a lot of inspiration pulled from that for WandaVision. Also a lot not pulled from it, but it's a huge, huge, it's the one you always hear about. Um, the Kree Skrull War, a lot of there was some stuff pulled from there was a lot pulled from that for Captain Marvel, but then they took they took put their own spin on it. Um, Behold the vision. And then of course there's other ones that are always floating around as really, really good ones or important ones to check out, like Civil War Two, the Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity War Run, Secret Wars, Days of Future Past, Daredevil, Born Again. Um, there's also X-Men Age of Apocalypse and the Dark Phoenix Saga obviously can't wait till the MCU does that storyline justice one day that'll be a long ways away from now though because we've already seen it twice on screen and both times were crap so yeah but here is my watch order and you're gonna think it's interesting Okay, but it's actually the best. Seriously, this is the best way to watch the MCU. So you start with Iron Man because obviously it's the one that starts it all, right? Uh, definitely watch the post credit scene because it really starts it all. You got Captain America, the first Avenger, next. But you don't watch the opening and you don't watch the ending yet. Seriously, this is how you do it. So no modern stuff. You just watch his arc in, in the past. Then you got Captain Marvel next. Here's why. Because it's a cool introduction to the cosmos and an even better introduction to Carol's character because then she leaves us early and when we finally see her again in the end, at the end, in the you know, later on, uh, the mid credit scene of this film, um, which you don't watch. You don't watch the mid credit scene of Captain Marvel after you watch Captain Marvel. You wait to watch it later. And it's a very, it's much more, it's like, oh shit, she's back. And we've been waiting for her to come back all this time. It's more impactful that way. That's why I do that next. It also just helps with some chronology. It's chronologically, it's better than going back in time, I think. It, it, which is fine. You could do it that way too. It's fine if you want to wait, 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 and then watch it. But I think I like it this way. Then Iron Man 2. Don't watch the post credit scene because it's literally just a scene from Thor. Then Thor... But before you watch Thor, you watch the Captain America opening for like a little tease for his return to the modern day, modern day age. Then you watch Thor. Then you watch the ending of Captain America to set us up for the Avengers. Then you watch the Thor post credit scene to really set us up for the Avengers. I'm not even kidding. This is the best way to watch it. Then you watch the Avengers with obviously the mid credit scene revealing Thanos because it's super important. Thor the Dark World next before Iron Man 3 because you get Thor the Dark World out of the way because it's the worst, <laughs> worst MCU film. Um, and you only watch the last post credit scene after you watch it um, if you want, but you could skip it. It's stupid. It doesn't even really matter. Uh, Iron Man 3 after that, and you can it's your choice if you want to watch the post credit with Banner, but definitely 
after that, go back to the mid credit scene of Thor 2 because it sets up Guardians of the Galaxy. And Captain America the Winter Soldier with the last post credit scene only. You save the mid credit. Okay? Guardians of the Galaxy. You can watch the post credit scene, but it's just Howard the Duck and it uh, doesn't mean anything. But then you definitely go back to the Cap 2 mid credit scene after you watch Guardians and it'll set you up for Age of Ultron nicely and introduce Wanda and Pietro for the first time. Then you watch Avengers Age of Ultron. Don't watch the Thanos post credit scene because it doesn't really work when he says, I'll do it myself. You'll be waiting a long time to see him do it himself. It doesn't make sense. So don't even watch that one, in my opinion. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, or what you could do is save it for like later, like after one of the other movies, just closer to Infinity War. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 after that. You know why? Because technically, chronologically, it happens very shortly after the first one. And also because we see our Guardians here for the last time until Infinity War. And so for similar reasons to Carol, it makes their return in Infinity War feel more impactful and exciting. Like, yes, they're back after not seeing them for a while. Um, I like I like that kind of stuff. Uh, forget the post-credits because for now they're just kind of big teases for Phase 4 and 5, so they don't mean anything. But they could soon someday, but they don't mean anything for the Infinity Saga. Uh, Ant-Man. With just the Hope and Hank post-credit scene that sets up the Wasp at the end. The other post-credit scene is literally just a scene from Cap uh, from Civil War, so don't even bother. Um, Doctor Strange, because I think chronologically it works the best here. Skip the post-credit scene because it's literally a scene from Thor Ragnarok, so don't watch that. Uh, Captain America Civil War after that, obviously, and with both post-credit scenes because they set up Black Panther and Spider-Man's solo films mm -hmm. now next you could either you could either order spider-man or black panther in either order first or second doesn't matter but whichever one you pick you watch the other one right after so spider-man homecoming and black panther with their post-credit scenes it's fine if you want to you don't have to um ant-man and the wasp but don't watch that uh that post-credit scene for obvious reasons. You'll see why, too. It's way better this way. We have all the snappy post-credit scenes and, like, stuff together kind of thing going on. Uh, then Thor Ragnarok is the best movie to watch right before Infinity War for plenty of reasons. First of all, the post-credit scene happens literally minutes before the opening of Infinity War, so it makes perfect sense to do Thor Ragnarok uh, right before um, also, saving Thor's third film for this late has a nice effect for the similar reasons I said before. Because we haven't seen him since Age of Ultron, so we get excited to watch him return after having not seen him for a while. It's also a very light and very funny film before two films about war, death, loss, right? So it's kind of like this calm before the storm thing that's nice, some levity before it gets really serious. Then obviously, Avengers Infinity War. And now here's what you do after watching Avengers Infinity War. You watch the last post credit scene with Fury calling Carol and disappearing. Then you go back and watch the Ant-Man and the Wasp mid credit scene and see Scott get stuck in the quantum realm because it's super important to the story, right? Then you finally watch the Captain Marvel mid credit scene which shows Carol showing up to Avengers Compound and it's like, wow, she's back after all these years. Where has she been? What's she doing? All that, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously, the event, Avengers Endgame finishes it off. Trust me on this. It's just, it's super fun this way. And, and then Spider Man Far From Home, WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. For now, by the way, same thing though with this next saga. We'll see that the way that they come out and then, you know, chronologically, just the way that they're meant to be watched just it's two different things so um for now you watch it wandavision the fact that it could be totally different down the road after i see more things come out I'll, I'll see what works better in what order you know honestly too i don't even watch it like this anymore i do it in tv form literally i do like an hour of of like i do iron man just iron man first but then i do like an hour 
of Cap, then an hour of Captain Marvel, then an hour of Captain... Because it feels even more connected and even more like one giant TV show. Because I'm crazy, dude. <laughs> Not even going to go into that because it's way too complex. Fun fact of the week. And of course, it's Marvel-themed. So here we go. This is probably one of the more known MCU facts, but it's also just the best one, so I'm going to go with it, especially for those who don't know about it. The Marvel Cinematic Universe was entirely riding on Iron Man being a huge success, a film that was in the making for years before finally entering production. If you didn't know, Iron Man was actually shopped around to multiple studios as far back as the 90s, but all of them either passed on or botched attempts at making the film. Fox opted out for the X-Men and Fantastic Four films instead, and New Line, which had writers working on it and a director in mind, got stalled indefinitely by an executive who didn't believe in the concept as being particularly marketable. By 2005, Marvel, Marvel was looking to start making their own movies, believing nobody knew better than them how to adapt their comics into films. So after the New Line deal on Iron Man expired, Marvel Studios was born, placing all their faith in Iron Man to launch the company. With popular characters like Spider-Man and X-Men in the possession of other studios, studios they sold those characters' rights to at the time in order to make movies at all, Marvel instead settled on B-list superheroes like Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor to inhabit their stories. Hence why Marvel and Disney had to wait so many years and spend a whole lot of money to reobtain many of those lost characters recently. Iron Man continued to be a gamble from the director chosen to the actor cast. It was actually expected to fail rather than go on to be one of the most successful superhero films of all time. From there, the studio and head Kevin Feige continued to keep faith in creative choices and risks producing other successes like the Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy. So always remember that without Iron Man being what it was, we would not have the immensely successful 23 film, two TV series so far, universe that we now have today. The question of the week this week is obvious. What is the best MCU film in your opinion? Here's the quote, too. I have to speed it up a little bit because I'm running out of battery. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye, and say, no, you move. And I fucked it up. Fuck. She says, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye, and say, no, you move. Fuck. I'm like freaking out because I think the phone's going to die and the computer's going to die. I didn't set up batteries. Shit. Shit. I'm sorry, guys. This is the special, though, and we're done. I have to end it. I have to end it. I'm going to have a whole new setup next week. Please come back for season two. And we are going to do some... A whole, I got a whole bunch of movies I plan on talking about. It's going to be fun. But real quick, obviously, we'll shout out to our patrons. As we do every week. Shout out to Billy Thomas. Jessica Murphy. Michael Morganti. Doolin Morganti. Tijan Construction. And Linda Morganti. Thank you for supporting the show. Supporting me. As always. Follow the show at Screen Preach. Follow me at Devenji. Subscribe to BMS Studios. Become a patron at patreon.com slash preacher. And definitely go check out my website at the BenMorgantiStory.com. Season 2 of Screen Preach officially begins next week with episode 51, Mortal Kombat, which I will be seeing in a theater. Hope you enjoy the movie and hope you enjoy the episode about the movie thanks for 
sticking with me here and watching and have a have a good week everybody I'm sorry if it wasn't as good a special but maybe I should have just waited till till tomorrow to record it but I have an even busier day tomorrow than I did today <laughs> hey man I like winging it like this and it was exciting at the end too I'm trying to beat the clock here this thing's gonna die any minute I hope the phone didn't yet oh my god here we go uh, goodbye guys seriously goodbye good good goodbye